And then there were none. Disc 2 Chapter 4 There was a moment's silence. A silence of dismay and bewilderment. Then the judge's small, clear voice took up the thread once more. We will now proceed to the next stage of our inquiry. First, however, I will just add my own credentials to the list. He took a letter from his pocket and tossed it onto the table. This purports to be from an old friend of mine, Lady Constance Calmington. I have not seen her for some years. As she went to the east. It is exactly the kind of vague, incoherent letter she would write, urging me to join her here and referring to her host and hostess in the vaguest of terms. The same technique, you will observe. I only mention it because it agrees with the other evidence, from all of which emerges one interesting point. Whoever it was who enticed us here, that person knows, or has taken the trouble to find out, a good deal about us all. He, whoever he may be, is aware of my friendship for Lady Constance, and is familiar with her epistolary style. He knows something about Dr. Armstrong's colleagues, and their present whereabouts. He knows the nickname of Mr. Marston's friend, and the kind of telegrams he sends. He knows exactly where Miss Brent was two years ago for her holiday, and the kind of people she met there. He knows all about General MacArthur's old cronies. He paused. Then he said, He knows, you see, a good deal. And out of his knowledge concerning us, he has made certain definite accusations. Immediately a babel broke out. General MacArthur shouted, A pack of damn lies! Slander! Vera cried out, It's, it's iniquitous! A breath came fast. Wicked! Rogers said hoarsely, A lie! A wicked lie! We never did! Neither of us! Anthony Marston growled, Don't know what the damn fool was getting at. The upraised hand of Mr. Justice Wargrave calmed the tumult. He said, picking his words with care, I wish to say this. Our unknown friend accuses me of the murder of one Edward Seaton. I remember Seaton perfectly well. He came up before me for trial in June of the year 1930. He was charged with the murder of an elderly woman. He was very ably defended and made a good impression on the jury in the witness box. Nevertheless, on the evidence, he was certainly guilty. I summed up accordingly, and the jury brought in a verdict of guilty. In passing sentence of death, I concurred with the verdict. An appeal was lodged on the grounds of misdirection. The appeal was rejected, and the man was duly executed. I wish to say before you all that my conscience is perfectly clear on the matter. I did my duty, and nothing more. I passed sentence on a rightly convicted murderer. Armstrong was remembering now. The Seton case. The verdict had come as a great surprise. He had met Matthews, Casey, on one of the days of the trial dining at a restaurant. Matthews had been confident. Not a doubt of the verdict. Acquittal practically certain. And then afterwards he had heard comments. Judge was dead against him. Turned the jury right round, and they brought him in guilty. Quite legal, though. Old Wargrave knows his law. It was almost as though he had a private down on the fellow. All these memories rushed through the doctor's mind. Before he could consider the wisdom of the question, he had asked impulsively, Did you know Seaton at all? I mean, previous to the case. The hooded reptilian eyes met his. In a clear, cold voice, the judge said, I knew nothing of Seaton previous to the case. Armstrong said to himself, The fellow's lying. I know he's lying. Vera Claythorne spoke in a trembling voice. She said, I'd like to tell you about that child, Cyril Hamilton. I was nursery governess to him. He was forbidden to swim out far. One day, when my attention was distracted, he started off. I swam after him. I couldn't get there in time. It was awful. But it wasn't my fault. At the inquest, the coroner exonerated me. And his mother, she, she was so kind. If even she didn't blame me, why should, why should this awful thing be said? It's not fair, not fair, she broke down, weeping bitterly. 
General MacArthur patted her shoulder. He said, There, there, my dear. Of course it's not true. Fellow's a madman. A madman. Got a bee in his bonnet. Got hold of the wrong end of the stick all round. He stood erect, squaring his shoulders. He barked out, Best really to leave this sort of thing unanswered. However, I feel I ought to say, no truth. No truth whatsoever in what he said about, uh, young, uh, Arthur Richmond. Richmond was one of my officers. I sent him on a reconnaissance. He was killed. Natural course of events in wartime. Wish to say resent very much. Slur on my wife. Best woman in the world, absolutely. Caesar's wife. General MacArthur sat down. His shaking hand pulled at his moustache. The effort to speak had cost him a good deal. Lombard spoke. His eyes were amused. He said, About those natives. Marston said, What about them? Philip Lombard grinned. <laughs> Story's quite true. I left them. Matter of self-preservation. We were lost in the bush. I and a couple of other fellows took what food there was and cleared out. General MacArthur said sternly, You abandoned your men? Left them to starve? Lombard said, Not quite the act of a pucker sub, I'm afraid, but self-preservation's a man's first duty. And natives don't mind dying, you know. They don't feel about it as Europeans do. Vera lifted her face from her hands, she said, staring at him. You left them to die? Lombard answered, I left them to die. His amused eyes looked into her horrified ones. Antony Marston said in a slow, puzzled voice, I've just been thinking. John and Lucy Coombs. Must have been a couple of kids I ran over near Cambridge. Beastly bad luck. Mr. Justice Wargrave said acidly, For them or for you? Antony said, Well, I was thinking... For me, but of course, <laughs> well, you're right, sir, it was damn bad luck on them. Of course, it was a pure accident. They rushed out of some cottage or other. I had my license endorsed for a year. Beastly nuisance. Dr. Armstrong said warmly, This speeding's all wrong, all wrong. Young men like you are a danger to the community. Antony shrugged his shoulders. He said, Speed's come to stay. English roads are hopeless, of course. Can't get up a decent pace on them. He looked round vaguely for his glass, picked it up off a table, and went over to the side table, and helped himself to another whiskey and soda. He said over his shoulder, Well, anyway, it wasn't my fault. Just an accident. The manservant, Rogers, had been moistening his lips and twisting his hands. He said now in a low, deferential voice, If I might just say a word, sir. Lombard said, Go ahead, Rogers. Rogers cleared his throat and passed his tongue once more over his dry lips. There was a mention, sir, of me and Mrs. Rogers and of Miss Brady. There isn't a word of truth in it, sir. My wife and I were with Miss Brady till she died. She was always in poor health, sir. Always, from the time we came to her. There was a storm, sir, that night, the night she was taken bad. The telephone was out of order. We couldn't get the doctor to her. I went for him, sir, on foot, but he got there too late. We'd done everything possible for her. Devoted to her, we were. Anyone will tell you the same. There was never a word said against us. Not a word. Lombard looked thoughtfully at the man's twitching face, his dry lips, the fright in his eyes. He remembered the crash of the falling coffee tray. He thought, but did not say... Oh, yeah. Bloor spoke, spoke in his hearty, bullying, official manner. He said, Came into a little something at her death, though, eh? Rogers drew himself up. He said stiffly, Miss Brady left us a legacy in recognition of our faithful services, and why not, I'd like to know? Lombard said, What about yourself, Mr. Bloor? Well, what about me? Your name was included in the list. Bloor went purple. Landor, you mean? <laughs> oh, that was the bank robbery. London and commercial. Mr. Justice Wargrave stirred. He said, I remember. 
It didn't come before me, but I remember the case. Landor was convicted on your evidence. You were the police officer in charge of the case. Bloor said, I was. Landor got penal servitude for life and died in Dartmoor a year later. He was a delicate man. Bloor said, He was a crook. It was he who knocked out the night watchman. The case was quite clear against him. Wargrave said slowly, You were complimented, I think, on your able handling of the case. Bloor said sulkily, I got my promotion. He added in a thick voice, I was only doing my duty. Lombard laughed, a sudden ringing laugh. He said, <laughs> What a duty-loving, law-abiding lot we all seem to be, myself excepted. What about you, Doctor, and your little professional mistake? Illegal operation, was it? Emily Brent glanced at him in sharp distaste and drew herself away a little. Dr. Armstrong, very much master of himself, shook his head good-humouredly. I am at a loss to understand the matter, he said. The name meant nothing to me when it was spoken. What was it? Please? Close? I really can't remember having a patient of that name or being connected with a death in any way. The thing's a complete mystery to me. Of course, it's a long time ago. It might possibly be one of my operation cases in hospital. They come too late, so many of these people. Then, when the patient dies, they always consider it's the surgeon's fault. He sighed, shaking his head. He thought, drunk, that's what it was, drunk, and I operated, nerves all to pieces, hands shaking, I killed her all right. Poor devil, elderly woman, simple job if I'd been sober. Lucky for me there's loyalty in our profession. The sister knew, of course, but she held her tongue. God, it gave me a shock, pulled me up. But who could have known about it, after all these years? There was silence in the room. Everybody was looking, covertly or openly, at Emily Brent. It was a minute or two before she became aware of the expectation. Her eyebrows rose on her narrow forehead. She said, Are you waiting for me to say something? I have nothing to say. The judge said, Nothing, Miss Brent? Nothing. Her lips closed tightly. The judge stroked his face. He said mildly, you reserve your defence, Miss Brent said coldly. There is no question of defence. I have always acted in accordance with the dictates of my conscience. I have nothing with which to reproach myself. There was an unsatisfied feeling in the air, but Emily Brent was not one to be swayed by public opinion. She sat unyielding. The judge cleared his throat once or twice, then he said, Our inquiry rests there. Now, Rogers, who else is there on this island besides ourselves and you and your wife? Nobody, sir. Nobody at all. You're sure of that? Quite sure, sir. Wargrave said, I am not yet clear as to the purpose of our unknown host in getting us to assemble here, but in my opinion this person, whoever he may be, is not sane in the accepted sense of the word. He may be dangerous. In my opinion, it would be well for us to leave this place as soon as possible. I suggest that we leave tonight. Rogers said, I beg your pardon, sir, but there's no boat on the island. No boat at all? No, sir. How do you communicate with the mainland? Fred Narricott. He comes over every morning, sir. He brings the bread and the milk and the post and takes the orders. Mr. Justice Wargrave said, then, in my opinion, it would be well if we all left tomorrow morning as soon as Narricott's boat arrives. There was a chorus of agreement, with only one dissentient voice. It was Antony Marston who disagreed with the majority. A bit unsporting, what? he said. Or to ferret out the mystery before we go. Whole thing's like a detective story, positively thrilling. The judge said acidly, At my time of life... I have no desire for thrills, as you call them. Antony said with a grin, The legal life's narrowing. I'm all for crime. Here's to it. He picked up his drink and drank it off at a gulp. Too quickly, perhaps, he choked. Choked badly. His face contorted, turned purple. He gasped for breath, then slid down off his chair, the glass falling from his hand.
Chapter 5 It was so sudden and so unexpected that it took everyone's breath away. They remained stupidly staring at the crumpled figure on the ground. Then Dr. Armstrong jumped up and went over to him, kneeling beside him. When he raised his head, his eyes were bewildered. He said in a low, awestruck whisper, My God! He's dead! They didn't take it in. Not at once. Dead? Dead? That young Norse god in the prime of his health and strength, struck down all in a moment? Healthy young men didn't die like that, choking over a whiskey and soda? No. They couldn't take it in. Dr. Armstrong was peering into the dead man's face. He sniffed at the blue, twisted lips. Then he picked up the glass from which Antony Marston had been drinking. General MacArthur said, Dead? Do you mean the fellow just choked and... and died? The physician said, You can call it choking if you like. He died of asphyxiation right enough. He was sniffing now at the glass. He dipped a finger into the dregs and very cautiously just touched the finger with the tip of his tongue. His expression altered. General MacArthur said, Never knew a man could die like that. Just of a choking fit? Emily Brent said in a clear voice, In the midst of life, we are in death. Dr. Armstrong stood up. He said briskly, No, a man doesn't die of a mere choking fit. Marston's death wasn't what we call a natural death. Vera said, almost in a whisper, Was there something in the whiskey? Armstrong nodded. Yes, can't say exactly. Everything points to one of the cyanides. No distinctive smell of prussic acid, probably potassium cyanide. It acts pretty well instantaneously. The judge said sharply, It was in his glass? Yes. The doctor strode to the table where the drinks were. He removed the stopper from the whiskey and smelt and tasted it. Then he tasted the soda water. He shook his head. They're both all right. Lombard said, You mean, he must have put the stuff in his glass himself? Armstrong nodded with a curiously dissatisfied expression. He said, Seems like it. Bloor said, Suicide, eh? Well, that's a queer go. Vera said slowly, You'd never think that he would kill himself. He was so alive. He was, oh, enjoying himself. When he came down the hill in his car this evening, he looked... He looked, oh, I, I can't explain. But they knew what she meant. Antony Marston, in the height of his youth and manhood, had seemed like a being who was immortal. And now, crumpled and broken, he lay on the floor. Dr. Armstrong said, Is there any possibility other than suicide? Slowly everyone shook his head. There could be no other explanation. The drinks themselves were untampered with. They had all seen Antony Marston go across and help himself. It followed, therefore, that any cyanide in the drink must have been put there by Antony Marston himself. And yet, why should Antony Marston commit suicide? Bloor said thoughtfully, You know, Doctor, it doesn't seem right to me. I shouldn't have said that Mr. Marston was a suicidal type of gentleman. Armstrong answered, I agree. They had left it like that. What else was there to say? Together, Armstrong and Lombard had carried the inert body of Antony Marston to his bedroom and had laid him there, covered over with a sheet. When they came downstairs again, the others were standing in a group, shivering a little, though the night was not cold. Emily Brent said, We'd better go to bed. It's late. It was past twelve o'clock. The suggestion was a wise one, yet... Everyone hesitated. It was as though they clung to each other's company for reassurance. The judge said, Yes, we must get some sleep. Rogers said, oh, I haven't cleared yet in the dining room. Lombard said curtly, Do it in the morning. Armstrong said to him, Is your wife all right? I'll go and see, sir. He returned a minute or two later. Sleeping beautiful, she is. 
Good, said the doctor. Don't disturb her. No, sir. I'll just put things straight in the dining room and make sure everything's locked up right, and then I'll turn in. He went across the hall into the dining room. The others went upstairs, a slow, unwilling procession. If this had been an old house with creaking wood and dark shadows and heavily panelled walls, there might have been an eerie feeling. But this house was the essence of modernity. There were no dark corners, no possible sliding panels. It was flooded with electric light. Everything was new and bright and shining. There was nothing hidden in this house, nothing concealed. It had no atmosphere about it. Somehow, that was the most frightening thing of all. They exchanged good nights on the upper landing. Each of them went into his or her own room, and each of them automatically, almost without conscious thought, locked the door. In his pleasant, softly tinted room, Mr. Justice Wargrave removed his garments and prepared himself for bed. He was thinking about Edward Seaton. He remembered Seaton very well, his fair hair, his blue eyes, his habit of looking you straight in the face with a pleasant air of straightforwardness. That was what had made so good an impression on the jury. Llewellyn, for the crown, had bungled it a bit. He had been over-vehement, had tried to prove too much. Matthews, on the other hand, for the defence had been good. His points had told. His cross-examinations had been deadly. His handling of his client in the witness-box had been masterly. And Seaton had come through the ordeal of cross-examination well. He had not got excited or over-vehement. The jury had been impressed. It had seemed to Matthews, perhaps, as though everything had been over bar the shouting. The judge wound up his watch carefully and placed it by the bed. He remembered exactly how he had felt sitting there, listening, making notes, appreciating everything, tabulating every scrap of evidence that told against the prisoner. He'd enjoyed that case. Matthew's final speech had been first class. Llewellyn, coming after it, had failed to remove the good impression that the defending counsel had made. And then had come his own summing up. Carefully, Mr. Justice Wargrave removed his false teeth and dropped them into a glass of water. The shrunken lips fell in. It was a cruel mouth now, cruel and predatory. Putting his eyes, the judge smiled at himself. He'd cooked Seaton's goose all right. With a slightly rheumatic grunt, he climbed into bed and turned out the electric light. Downstairs in the dining room, Rogers stood puzzled. He was staring at the china figures in the centre of the table. He muttered to himself, Well, that's a rum go. I could have sworn there were ten of them. General MacArthur tossed from side to side. Sleep would not come to him. In the darkness, he kept seeing Arthur Richmond's face. He'd liked Arthur. He'd been damned fond of Arthur. He'd been pleased that Leslie liked him, too. Leslie was so capricious. Lots of good fellows that Leslie would turn up her nose at and pronounce dull. Dull, just like that. But she hadn't found Arthur Richmond dull. They'd got on well together from the beginning. They'd talked of plays and music and pictures together. She'd teased him, made fun of him, ragged him, and he, MacArthur, had been delighted at the thought that Leslie took quite a motherly interest in the boy. <laughs> motherly, indeed. Damn fool not to remember that Richmond was twenty-eight to Leslie's twenty-nine. He'd loved Leslie. He could see her now, her heart-shaped face, and her dancing, deep, grey eyes and the brown, curling mass of her hair, he'd loved Leslie, and he'd believed in her absolutely. Out there in France, in the middle of all the hell of it, he'd sat thinking of her, taken her picture out of the breast pocket of his tunic, and then he'd found out. It had come about exactly in the way things happened in books, the letter in the wrong envelope. She'd been writing to them both, and she'd put her letter to Richmond in the envelope addressed to her husband. Even now, all these years later, he could feel the shock of it, the pain. God, it had hurt. And the business had been going on for some time. The letter made that clear. Weekends. 
Richmond's last leave. Leslie. Leslie and Arthur. God damn the fellow. Damn his smiling face, his brisk, yes, sir, liar and hypocrite, stealer of another man's wife. It had gathered slowly, that cold, murderous rage. He'd managed to carry on as usual, to show nothing. He tried to make his manner to Richmond just the same. Had he succeeded? He thought so. Richmond hadn't suspected. Inequalities of temper were easily accounted for out there, where men's nerves were continually snapping under the strain. Only young Armitage had looked at him curiously once or twice. Quite a young chap, but he'd had perceptions, that boy. Armitage perhaps had guessed when the time came. He'd sent Richmond deliberately to death. Only a miracle could have brought him through unhurt. That miracle didn't happen. Yes, he'd sent Richmond to his death, and he wasn't sorry. It had been easy enough. Mistakes were being made all the time, officers being sent to death needlessly. All was confusion, panic. People might say afterwards, Old MacArthur lost his nerve a bit, made some colossal blunders, sacrificed some of his best men. They couldn't say more. But young Armitage was different. He'd looked at his commanding officer very oddly. He'd known, perhaps, that Richmond was being deliberately sent to death. And after the war was over, had Armitage talked? Leslie hadn't known. Leslie had wept for her lover, he supposed, but her weeping was over by the time he'd come back to England. He'd never told her that he'd found her out. They'd gone on together. Only somehow, she hadn't seemed very real any more. And then, three or four years later, she'd got double pneumonia and died. That had been a long time ago. Fifteen years? Sixteen years? And he'd left the army and come to live in Devon, bought the sort of little place he'd always meant to have. Nice neighbours, pleasant part of the world. There was a bit of shooting and fishing. He'd gone to church on Sundays. But not the day the lesson was read about David putting Uriah in the forefront of the battle. Somehow he couldn't face that. It gave him an uncomfortable feeling. Everybody had been very friendly. At first, that is. Later, he'd had an uneasy feeling that people were talking about him behind his back. They eyed him differently somehow, as though they'd heard something. Some lying rumour. Armitage? Supposing Armitage had talked. He'd avoided people after that, withdrawn into himself. Unpleasant to feel that people were discussing you. And all so long ago. So, so purposeless now. Leslie had faded into the distance, and Arthur Richmond, too. Nothing of what had happened seemed to matter any more. It made life lonely, though. He'd taken to shunning his old army friends. If Armitage had talked, they'd know about it. And now, this evening, a hidden voice had blared out that old hidden story. Had he dealt with it all right? Kept a stiff upper lip? Betrayed the right amount of feeling, indignation, disgust, but no guilt? No discomfiture. Difficult to tell. Surely nobody could have taken the accusation seriously. There had been a pack of other nonsense, just as far-fetched. That charming girl, the voice had accused her of drowning a child, idiotic. Some madman throwing crazy accusations about. Emily Brent, too. Actually, a niece of old Tom Brent of the regiment. It had accused her of murder. Anyone could see with half an eye that the woman was as pious as could be the kind that was hand and glove with Parsons. Damned curious business, the whole thing. Crazy. Nothing less. Ever since they had got there, when was that? Why, damn it, it was only this afternoon. Seemed a good bit longer than that. He thought, I wonder when we shall get away again. Oh, tomorrow, of course, when the motorboat comes from the mainland. Funny. Just this minute he didn't want much to get away from the island. To go back to the mainland, back to his little house, back to all the troubles and worries. Through the open window he could hear the waves breaking on the rocks, a little louder now than earlier in the evening. Wind was getting up, too. He thought, peaceful sound, peaceful place. He thought, best of an island is, once you get there, you can't go any further. You've come to the end of things. He knew, suddenly, that he didn't want to leave the island. Vera Claythorne 
lay in bed, wide awake, staring up at the ceiling. The light beside her was on. She was frightened of the dark. She was thinking, Hugo, Hugo, why do I feel you're so near me tonight? Somewhere quite close. Where is he really? I don't know. I never shall know. He just went away, right away, out of my life. It was no good trying not to think of Hugo. He was close to her. She had to think of him, to remember. Cornwall. The black rocks. The smooth yellow sand. Mrs. Hamilton, stout, good-humoured. Cyril, whining a little, always pulling at her hand. I want to swim out to the rock, Miss Claythorne. Why can't I swim out to the rock? Looking up, meeting Hugo's eyes, watching her. The evenings after Cyril was in bed. Come out for a stroll, Miss Claythorne. I think perhaps I will. The decorous stroll down to the beach, the moonlight, the soft Atlantic air, and then Hugo's arms around her. I love you. I love you. You know I love you, Vera. Yes, she knew. Or thought she knew. I can't ask you to marry me. I've not got a penny. It's all I can do to keep myself. Queer, you know. Once, for three months, I had the chance of being a rich man to look forward to. Cyril wasn't born until three months after Morris died. If he'd been a girl... If the child had been a girl, Hugo would have come into everything. He'd been disappointed, he admitted. I hadn't built on it, of course, but it was a bit of a knock. Oh, well. Luck's luck. Cyril's a nice kid. I'm awfully fond of him. And he was fond of him, too. Always ready to play games or amuse his small nephew. No rancor in Hugo's nature. Cyril wasn't really strong, a puny child. No stamina. The kind of child, perhaps, who wouldn't live to grow up. And then... Miss Claythorne, why can't I swim to the rock? Irritating, whiny repetition. It's too far, Cyril. But Miss Claythorne... Vera got up. She went to the dressing table and swallowed three aspirins. She thought, I wish I had some proper sleeping stuff. She thought, if I were doing away with myself, I'd take an overdose of Veronal, something like that, not cyanide. She shuddered as she remembered Antony Marston's convulsed purple face. As she passed the mantelpiece, she looked up at the framed doggerel. Ten little Indian boys went out to dine. One choked his little self, and then there were nine. She thought to herself, It's horrible, just like us this evening. Why had Antony Marston wanted to die? She didn't want to die. She couldn't imagine wanting to die. Death was for the other people. Chapter 6 Dr. Armstrong was dreaming. It was very hot in the operating room. Surely they'd got the temperature too high. The sweat was rolling down his face. His hands were clammy, difficult to hold the scalpel firmly. How beautifully sharp it was. Easy to do a murder with a knife like that. And, of course, he was doing a murder. The woman's body looked different. It had been a large, unwieldy body. This was a spare, meagre body, and the face was hidden. Who was it that he had to kill? He couldn't remember, but he must know. Should he ask Sister? Sister was watching him. No, he couldn't ask her. She was suspicious. He could see that. But who was it on the operating table? They shouldn't have covered up the face like that. If only he could see the face. Ah, that was better. A young probationer was pulling off the handkerchief. Emily Brent, of course. It was Emily Brent that he had to kill. How malicious her eyes were. Her lips were moving. What was she saying? In the midst of life, we are in death. She was laughing now. No, nurse, don't put the handkerchief back. I've got to see. I've got to give the anaesthetic. Where's the ether? I must have brought the ether with me. What have you done with the ether, sister? Shut her nerve to pap, yes? Yes, that will do quite as well. Take the handkerchief away, nurse. Of course, I knew it all the time. It's Antony Marston. His face is purple and convulsed, but he's not dead. He's laughing. I tell you, he's laughing. He's shaking the operating table. Look out, man. Look out. Nurse, steady it, steady it. 
With a start, Dr. Armstrong woke up. It was morning. Sunlight was pouring into the room. And someone was leaning over him, shaking him. It was Rogers. Rogers, with a white face, saying, Doctor! Doctor! Dr. Armstrong woke up completely. He sat up in bed. He said sharply, What is it? It's the wife, Doctor. I can't get it awake. My God, I can't get it awake, and she don't look right to me. Dr. Armstrong was quick and efficient. He wrapped himself in his dressing gown and followed Rogers. He bent over the bed where the woman was lying peacefully on her side. He lifted the cold hand, raised the eyelid. It was some few minutes before he straightened himself and turned from the bed. Rogers whispered, Is she? Is she? He passed a tongue over dry lips. Armstrong nodded. Yes, she's gone. His eyes rested thoughtfully on the man before him. Then they went to the table by the bed, to the washstand, then back to the sleeping woman. Rogers said, Was it? Was it? Her heart, Doctor? Dr. Armstrong was a minute or two before replying. Then he said, What was her health like normally? Rogers said, she was a bit rheumatic-y. Any doctor been attending her recently? Doctor? Rogers stared. Not been to a doctor for years. Neither of us. You'd no reason to believe she suffered from heart trouble? Well, no doctor. I never knew of anything. Armstrong said, Did she sleep well? Now Rogers' eyes evaded his. The man's hands came together and turned and twisted uneasily. He muttered, She... Didn't sleep extra well, no. The doctor said sharply, Did she take things to make her sleep? Rogers stared at him, surprised. Take things? To make her sleep? Not that I knew of. Well, I'm sure she didn't. Armstrong went over to the washstand. There were a certain number of bottles on it. Hair lotion, lavender water, cascara, glycerin of cucumber for the hands, a mouthwash, toothpaste, and some elements. Rogers helped by pulling out the drawers of the dressing table. From there they moved on to the chest of drawers, but there was no sign of sleeping draughts or tablets. Rogers said, She didn't have nothing last night, sir, except what you gave her. When the gong sounded for breakfast at nine o'clock, it found everyone up and awaiting the summons. General MacArthur and the judge had been pacing the terrace outside, exchanging desultory comments on the political situation. Vera Claythorne and Philip Lombard had been up to the summit of the island behind the house. There they had discovered William Henry Blore, standing staring at the mainland. He said, No sign of that motorboat yet. I've been watching for it, Vera said, smiling. Devon's a sleepy county. Things are usually late. Philip Lombard was looking the other way, out to sea. He said abruptly, What do you think of the weather? Glancing up at the sky, Blore remarked, Well, looks all right to me. Lombard pursed up his mouth into a whistle. He said, It will come on to blow before the day's out. Blore said, Squally, eh? From below them came the boom of a gong. Philip Lombard said, Breakfast? Well, I could do with some. As they went down the steep slope, Blore said to Lombard in a ruminating voice, You know, it beats me why that young fellow wanted to do himself in. I've been worrying about it all night. Vera was a little ahead. Lombard hung back slightly. He said, Got any alternative theory? I'd want some proof. Motive, to begin with. Oh, well off, I should say he was. Emily Brent came out of the drawing-room window to meet them. She said sharply, "'Is the boat coming?' "'Not yet,' said Vera. They went into breakfast. There was a vast dish of eggs and bacon on the sideboard, and tea and coffee. Rogers held the door open for them to pass in, then shut it from the outside. Emily Brent said, "'That man looks ill this morning.' Dr. Armstrong, who was standing by the window, cleared his throat. He said, "'You must excuse any uh, shortcomings this morning.' Rogers has had to do the best he can for breakfast single-handed. Mrs. Rogers has, uh, not been able to carry on this morning. Emily Brent said sharply, What's the matter with the woman? 
Dr. Armstrong said easily. Let's start our breakfast. The eggs will be cold. Afterwards, there are several matters I want to discuss with you all. They took the hint. Plates were filled, coffee and tea was poured, the meal began. Discussion of the island was, by mutual consent, tabooed. They spoke instead in a desultory fashion of current events, the news from abroad, events in the world of sport, the latest reappearance of the Loch Ness Monster. Then, when plates were cleared, Dr. Armstrong moved back his chair a little, cleared his throat importantly, and spoke. He said, I thought it better to wait until you had had your breakfast before telling you of a sad piece of news. Mrs. Rogers died in her sleep. There were startled and shocked ejaculations. Vera exclaimed, How awful! Two deaths on this island since we arrived! Mr. Justice Wargrave, his eyes narrowed, said in his small, precise, clear voice, Hmm, very remarkable. What was the cause of death? Armstrong shrugged his shoulders. Impossible to say offhand. There must be an autopsy? I certainly couldn't give a certificate. I have no knowledge whatsoever of the woman's state of health. Vera said, She was a very nervous-looking creature and she had a shock last night. It might have been heart failure, I suppose. Dr. Armstrong said dryly, Her heart certainly failed to beat, but what caused it to fail is the question. One word fell from Emily Brent. It fell hard and clear into the listening group. Conscience, she said. Armstrong turned to her. What exactly do you mean by that, Miss Brent? Emily Brent, her lips tight and hard, said, you all heard? She was accused, together with her husband, of having deliberately murdered her former employer, an old lady. And you think, Emily Brent said, I think that that accusation was true. You all saw her last night. She broke down completely and fainted. The shock of having her wickedness brought home to her was too much for her. She literally died of fear. Dr. Armstrong shook his head doubtfully. It is a possible theory, he said. One cannot adopt it without more exact knowledge of her state of health. If there was cardiac weakness, Emily Brent said quietly, call it, if you prefer, an act of God. Everyone looked shocked. Mr. Bloor said uneasily, oh, That's carrying things a bit far, Miss Brent. She looked at them with shining eyes. Her chin went up. She said, You regard it as impossible that a sinner should be struck down by the wrath of God? I do not. The judge stroked his chin. He murmured in a slightly ironic voice, My dear lady, in my experience of ill-doing, providence leaves the work of conviction and chastisement to us mortals, and the process is often fraught with difficulties. There are no shortcuts. Emily Brent shrugged her shoulders. Bloor said sharply, What did she have to eat and drink last night, after she went up to bed? Armstrong said, Nothing. Well, she didn't take anything. Cup of tea? Drink of water? I'll bet you she had a cup of tea. That sort always does. Rogers assures me she had nothing whatsoever. Ah, said Bloor. But he might say so. His tone was so significant that the doctor looked at him sharply. Philip Lombard said, So that's your idea. Bloor said aggressively, Well, why not? We all heard that accusation last night. Maybe sheer moonshine, just plain lunacy. On the other hand, it may not. Allow for the moment that it's true. Rogers and his missus polished off that old lady. Well, where does that get you? They've been feeling quite safe and happy about it, Vera interrupted. In a low voice she said, No, I don't think Mrs. Rogers ever felt safe. Bloor looked slightly annoyed at the interruption. Just like a woman, his glance said. He resumed. Well, that's as may be. Anyway, there's no active danger to them as far as they know. Then, last night, some unknown lunatic spills the beans. What happens? The woman cracks. She goes to pieces. Notice how her husband hung over her as she was coming round? Not all husbandly solicitude. Not on your life. He was like a cat on hot bricks, scared out of his life as to what she might say. And there's the position for you. They've done a murder and got away with it. But if the whole thing's going to be raked up, what's going to happen? 
Ten to one, the woman will give the show away. She hasn't got the nerve to stand up and brazen it out. She's a living danger to her husband, that's what she is. He's all right. He'll lie with a straight face till kingdom comes. But he can't be sure of her. And if she goes to pieces, his neck's in danger. So, he slips something into a cup of tea and makes sure that her mouth is shut permanently. Armstrong said slowly, There was no empty cup by her bedside. There was nothing there at all. I looked. Bloor snorted. <laughs> well, of course there wouldn't be. First thing he'd do when she drunk it would be take that cup and saucer away and wash it up carefully. There was a pause. Then General MacArthur said doubtfully, well, It may be so, but I should hardly think it possible that a man would do that to his wife. Law gave a short laugh. He said, When a man's neck's in danger, he doesn't stop to think too much about sentiment. There was a pause. Before anyone could speak, the door opened and Rogers came in. He said, looking from one to the other, Is there anything more I can get you? I'm sorry there was so little toast, but we've run right out of bread. The new bread hasn't come over from the mainland yet. Mr. Justice Wargrave stirred a little in his chair. He asked, At What time does the motorboat usually come over? Between seven and eight, sir. Sometimes it's a bit after eight. Don't know what Fred Narricott can be doing this morning. If he's ill, he'd send his brother. Philip Lombard said, What's the time now? Ten minutes to ten, sir. Lombard's eyebrows rose. He nodded slowly to himself. Rogers waited a minute or two. General MacArthur spoke suddenly and explosively. Sorry to hear about your wife, Rogers. Doctor's just been telling us. Rogers inclined his head. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. He took up the empty bacon dish and went out. Again there was silence. On the terrace outside, Philip Lombard said, About this motorboat. Bloor looked at him. Bloor nodded his head. He said, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Lombard. I've asked myself the same question. Motorboat ought to have been here nigh on two hours ago. It hasn't come. Why? Found the answer? asked Lombard. It's not an accident. That's what I say. It's part and parcel of the whole business. It's all bound up together. Philip Lombard said, It won't come, you think? A voice spoke behind him, a testy, impatient voice. The motorboat's not coming, he said. Bloor turned his square shoulder slightly and viewed the last speaker thoughtfully. You think not too, General? General MacArthur said sharply, Well, of course it won't come. We're counting on the motorboat to take us off the island. That's the meaning of the whole business. We're not going to leave the island. None of us will ever leave. It's the end, you see. The end of everything. He hesitated. Then he said in a low, strange voice, That's peace. Real peace. To come to the end. Not to have to go on. Yes. Peace. He turned abruptly and walked away. Along the terrace, then down the slope towards the sea, obliquely, to the end of the island, where loose rocks went out into the water. He walked a little unsteadily, like a man who was only half awake. Bloor said, There goes another one who's balmy. Looks as though it'll end with a whole lot going that way. Philip Lombard said, I don't fancy you will, Bloor. The ex-inspector laughed. <laughs> it'll take a lot to send me off my head, he added dryly. And I don't think you'll be going that way either, Mr. Lombard, Philip Lombard said. Well, I feel quite sane at the minute. Thank you. Dr. Armstrong came out onto the terrace. He stood there, hesitating. To his left were Bloor and Lombard. To his right was Wargrave, slowly pacing up and down, his head bent down. Armstrong, after a moment of indecision, turned towards the latter. But at that moment Rogers came quickly out of the house. Can I have a word with you, sir, please? Armstrong turned. He was startled at what he saw. Rogers' face was working. Its color was grayish-green. His hands shook. 
It was such a contrast to his restraint of a few minutes ago that Armstrong was quite taken aback. Please, sir, if I could have a word with you, inside, sir. The doctor turned back and re-entered the house with the frenzied butler. He said, What's the matter, man? Pull yourself together. In here, sir. Come in here. He opened the dining room door. The doctor passed in. Rogers followed him and shut the door behind him. Well, said Armstrong, what is it? The muscles of Rogers' throat were working. He was swallowing. He jerked out, There's things going on, sir, that I don't understand. Armstrong said sharply, Things? What things? You'll think I'm crazy, sir. You'll say it isn't anything. But it's got to be explained, sir. It's got to be explained, because it doesn't make any sense. Well, man, tell me what it is. Don't go on talking in riddles. Rogers swallowed again. He said, It's those little figures, sir, in the middle of the table. The little china figures. Ten of them there were. I'll swear to that. Ten of them. Armstrong said, Yes, ten. We counted them last night at dinner. Rogers came nearer. But that's just it, sir. Last night, when I was clearing up, there wasn't but nine, sir. I noticed it and thought it queer. But that's all I thought. And now, sir, this morning, I didn't notice when I laid the breakfast. I was upset and all that. But now, sir, when I came to clear away, see for yourself if you don't believe me. There's only eight, sir. Only eight. It doesn't make sense, does it? Only eight. Chapter 7 After breakfast, Emily Brent had suggested to Vera Claythorne that they should walk up to the summit again and watch for the boat. Vera had acquiesced. The wind had freshened. Small white crests were appearing on the sea. There were no fishing boats out, and no sign of the motorboat. The actual village of Sticklehaven could not be seen, only the hill above it. A jutting-out cliff of red rock concealed the actual little bay. Emily Brent said, The man who brought us out yesterday seemed to be a dependable sort of person. It is really very odd that he should be so late this morning. Vera did not answer. She was fighting down a rising feeling of panic. She said to herself angrily, You must keep cool. This isn't like you. You've always had excellent nerves. Aloud, she said after a minute or two, I wish he would come. I... I want to get away. Emily Brent said dryly, I've no doubt we all do. Vera said, It's all so extraordinary. There seems no... no meaning in it all. The elderly woman beside her said briskly, I'm very annoyed with myself for being so easily taken in. Really, that letter is absurd when one comes to examine it. But I had no doubts at the time. None at all. Vera murmured mechanically, I suppose not. One takes things for granted too much, said Emily Brent. Vera drew a deep, shuddering breath. She said, Do you really think what you said at breakfast? Be a little more precise, my dear. To what in particular are you referring? Vera said in a low voice, Do you really think that Rogers and his wife did away with that old lady? Emily Brent gazed thoughtfully out to sea. Then she said, Personally, I am quite sure of it. But what do you think? I don't know what to think, Emily Brent said. Everything goes to support the idea. The way the woman fainted, and the man dropped the coffee tray, remember? Then the way he spoke about it, it... it didn't ring true. Oh, yes. I'm afraid they did it. Vera said, The way she looked, scared of her own shadow. I've never seen a woman look so frightened. She must have been always haunted by it. Miss Brent murmured. I remember a text that hung in my nursery as a child. Be sure thy sin will find thee out. It's very true, that. Be sure thy sin will find thee out. Vera scrambled to her feet. She said, But Miss Brent, Miss Brent, in that case— Yes, my dear? The others. What about the others? I don't quite understand you. All the other accusations. They— They weren't true. But if it's true about the Rogerses, she stopped, unable to make her chaotic thought clear. Emily Brent's brow, which had been frowning perplexedly, cleared. She said, Ah, I understand you now. Well, there is that Mr. Lombard. He admits to having abandoned twenty men to their deaths. Vera said, Well, they were only natives. 
Emily Brent said sharply, Black or white, they are our brothers. Vera thought, Our black brothers, our black brothers. Oh, I'm going to laugh. I'm hysterical. I'm not myself. Emily Brent continued thoughtfully, Of course. Some of the other accusations were very far-fetched and ridiculous, against the judge, for instance, who was only doing his duty in his public capacity, and the ex-Scotland Yard man. My own case, too. She paused and then went on. Naturally, considering the circumstances, I was not going to say anything last night. It was not a fit subject to discuss before gentlemen. No? Vera listened with interest. Miss Brent continued serenely. Beatrice Taylor was in service with me. Not a nice girl as I found out too late. I was very much deceived in her. She had nice manners and was very clean and willing. I was very pleased with her. Of course, all that was the sheerest hypocrisy. She was a loose girl with no morals. Disgusting. It was some time before I found out she was what they call in trouble. She paused, her delicate nose wrinkling itself in distaste. It was a great shock to me. Her parents were decent folk, too, who had brought her up very strictly. I am glad to say they did not condone her behaviour. Vera said, staring at Miss Brent, What happened? Well, naturally, I did not keep her an hour under my roof. No one shall ever say that I condoned immorality. Vera said in a lower voice, What happened to her? Miss Brent said, The abandoned creature, not content with having one sin on her conscience, committed a still graver sin. She took her own life. Vera whispered, horror-struck. She killed herself? Yes. She threw herself into the river. Vera shivered. She stared at the calm, delicate profile of Miss Brent. She said, What did you feel like when you knew she'd done that? Weren't you sorry? Didn't you blame yourself? Emily Brent drew herself up. I? I had nothing with which to reproach myself. Vera said, But if your hardness drove her to it, Emily Brent said sharply, Her own action, her own sin, that was what drove her to it. If she had behaved like a decent, modest young woman, none of this would have happened. She turned her face to Vera. There was no self-reproach, no uneasiness in those eyes. They were hard and self-righteous. Emily Brent sat on the summit of Indian Island, encased in her own armour of virtue. The little elderly spinster was no longer slightly ridiculous to Vera. Suddenly, she was terrible. Dr. Armstrong came out of the dining room, and once more came out on the terrace. The judge was sitting in a chair now, gazing placidly out to sea. Lombard and Bloor were over to the left, smoking but not talking. As before, the doctor hesitated for a moment. His eye rested speculatively on Mr. Justice Wargrave. He wanted to consult with someone. He was conscious of the judge's acute, logical brain, but nevertheless he wavered. Mr. Justice Wargrave might have a good brain, but he was an elderly man. At this juncture, Armstrong felt what was needed was a man of action. He made up his mind. Lombard, can I speak to you for a minute? Philip started. Well, of course. The two men left the terrace. They strolled down the slope towards the water. When they were out of earshot, Armstrong said, I want a consultation. Lombard's eyebrows went up. He said, My dear fellow, I've no medical knowledge. No, no. I mean as to the general situation. Oh, well, that's different. Armstrong said, Frankly, what do you think of the position? Lombard reflected a minute. Then he said, it's rather suggestive, isn't it? What are your ideas on the subject of that woman? Do you accept Bloor's theory? Philip puffed smoke into the air. He said, well, It's perfectly feasible. Taken alone. Exactly. Armstrong's tone sounded relieved. Philip Lombard was no fool. The latter went on. That is, accepting the premise that Mr. and Mrs. Rogers have successfully got away with murder in their time. And I don't see why they shouldn't. What do you think they did, exactly? Poisoned the old lady? Armstrong said slowly, It might be simpler than that. I asked Rogers this morning what this Miss Brady had suffered from. His answer was enlightening. 
I don't need to go into medical details, but in a certain form of cardiac trouble, amyl nitrate is used. When an attack comes on, an ampule of amyl nitrate is broken, and it is inhaled. If amyl nitrate were withheld, well, the consequences might easily be fatal. Philip Lombard said thoughtfully, as simple as that. Well, it must have been rather tempting. The doctor nodded. Yes, no positive action, no arsenic to obtain and administer, nothing definite, just negation. And Rogers hurried through the night to fetch a doctor, and they both felt confident that no one could ever know. And even if anyone knew, nothing could ever be proved against them, added Philip Lombard. He frowned suddenly. Of course. That explains a good deal. Armstrong said, puzzled, I beg your pardon? Lombard said, Well, I mean, it explains Indian Island. There are crimes that cannot be brought home to their perpetrators. Instance, the Rogerses. Another instance, Old Wargrave, who committed his murder strictly within the law. Armstrong said sharply, Would you believe that story? Philip Lombard smiled. Oh, yes. I believe it. Wargrave murdered Edward Seaton, all right, murdered him as surely as if he'd stuck a stiletto through him. But he was clever enough to do it from the judge's seat in wig and gown. So, in the ordinary way, you can't bring his little crime home to him. A sudden flash passed like lightning through Armstrong's mind. Murder in hospital. Murder on the operating table. Safe. Yes. Safe as houses. Philip Lombard was saying, Hence, Mr. Owen. Hence, Indian Island. Armstrong drew a deep breath. Now we're getting down to it. What's the real purpose of getting us all here? Philip Lombard said, What do you think? Armstrong said abruptly, Let's go back a minute to this woman's death. What are the possible theories? Rogers killed her because he was afraid she would give the show away. Second possibility, she lost her nerve and took an easy way out herself. Philip Lombard said, Suicide, eh? What do you say to that? Lombard said, Well, it could have been, yes. If it hadn't been for Marston's death, two suicides within twelve hours is a little too much to swallow. And if you tell me that Anthony Marston, a young bull with no nerves and precious little brains, got the wind up over having mowed down a couple of kids and deliberately put himself out of the way, <laughs> the idea is laughable. And anyway, how did he get hold of the stuff? From all I've heard, potassium cyanide isn't the kind of stuff you'd take about with you in your waistcoat pocket. But that's your line of country. Armstrong said, Nobody in their senses carries potassium cyanide. It might be done by someone who is going to take a wasp's nest. The ardent gardener or landowner, in fact. Again, not Anthony Marston. It strikes me that cyanide is going to need a bit of explaining. Either Anthony Marston meant to do away with himself before he came here, and therefore came prepared, or else— Armstrong prompted him. Or else? Philip Lombard grinned. <laughs> Why make me say it, when it's on the tip of your own tongue? Anthony Marston was murdered, of course. Dr. Armstrong drew a deep breath. And Mrs. Rogers? Lombard said slowly, I could believe in Anthony's suicide with difficulty— if it weren't for Mrs. Rogers. I could believe in Mrs. Rogers' suicide easily, if it weren't for Anthony Marston. I can believe that Rogers put his wife out of the way, if it were not for the unexplained death of Anthony Marston. But what we need is a theory to explain two deaths following rapidly on each other. Armstrong said, I can perhaps give you some help towards that theory. And he repeated the facts that Rogers had given him about the disappearance of the two little china figures. Lombard said, Yes, little china Indian figures. There were certainly ten last night at dinner, and now there are eight, you say. Dr. Armstrong recited, Ten little Indian boys going out to dine. One went and choked himself, and then there were nine. Nine little Indian boys sat up very late, one overslept himself, and then there were eight. The two men looked at each other. Philip Lombard grinned and flung away his cigarette. 
fits too damn well to be a coincidence. Anthony Marston dies of asphyxiation or choking last night after dinner, and Mother Rogers oversleeps herself with a vengeance. And therefore, said Armstrong, Lombard took him up. And therefore, another kind of puzzle. The cuckoo in the nest. X. Mr. Owen. U. N. Owen. One unknown lunatic at large. Ah. Armstrong breathed a sigh of relief. You agree. But you see what it involves. Rogers swore that there was no one but ourselves and he and his wife on the island. Rogers is wrong. Or possibly Rogers is lying. Armstrong shook his head. I don't think he's lying. The man's scared. He's scared nearly out of his senses. Philip Lombard nodded. He said, No motorboat this morning. That fits in. Mr. Owen's little arrangements again to the fore. Indian Island is to be isolated until Mr. Owen has finished his job. Armstrong had gone pale. He said, You realize, the man must be a raving maniac, Philip Lombard said, and there was a new ring in his voice. There's one thing Mr. Owen didn't realize. What's that? This island's more or less a bare rock. We shall make short work of searching it. We'll soon ferret out UN Owen, Esquire. Dr. Armstrong said warningly, He'll be dangerous. Philip Lombard laughed. Dangerous? Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? I'll be dangerous when I get hold of him. He paused and said, We'd better rope in Blore to help us. He'll be a good man in a pinch. Better not tell the women. As for the others, the General's Gaga, I think, and old Wargrave's forte is masterly inactivity. The three of us can attend to this job. End of Disc 2 And Then There Were None Disc 3 Chapter 8 Bloor was easily roped in. He expressed immediate agreement with their arguments. What you said about those China figures, sir, makes all the difference. That's crazy, that is. There's only one thing. You don't think this Owen's idea might be to do the job by proxy, as it were? Explain yourself, man. Well, I mean like this. After the racket last night, this young Mr. Marston gets the wind up and poisons himself. And Rogers, he gets the wind up too and bumps off his wife, all according to UNO's plan. Armstrong shook his head. He stressed the point about the cyanide. Law agreed. Yes, I'd forgotten that. Not a natural thing to be carrying about with you. But how did it get into his drink, sir? Lombard said. I've been thinking about that. Marston had several drinks that night. Between the time he had his last one and the time he finished the one before it, there was quite a gap. During that time, his glass was lying about on some table or other. I think, though I can't be sure, it was on the little table near the window. The window was open. Someone could have slipped a dose of cyanide into the glass. Law said unbelievingly, Without all our seeing him, sir? Lombard said dryly, We were all rather concerned elsewhere. Armstrong said slowly, That's true. We'd all been attacked. We were walking about, moving about the room, arguing, indignant, intent on our own business. I think it could have been done. Law shrugged his shoulders. Fact is, it must have been done. Now then, gentlemen, let's make a start. Nobody's got a revolver by any chance. I suppose that's too much to hope for. Lombard said, I've got one. He patted his pocket. Bloor's eyes opened very wide. He said in an over-casual tone, Always carry that about with you, sir? Lombard said, Usually. I've been in some tight places, you know. Oh said Bloor, and added, Well, you've probably never been in a tighter place than you are today. If there's a lunatic hiding on this island, he's probably got a young arsenal on him, to say nothing of a knife or a dagger or two. Armstrong coughed. You may be wrong there, Bloor. Many homicidal lunatics are very quiet, unassuming people. Delightful fellows. Bloor said, I don't feel this one is going to be of that kind, Dr. Armstrong. The three men started on their tour of the island. It proved unexpectedly simple. 
On the northwest side, towards the coast, the cliffs fell sheer to the sea below, their surface unbroken. On the rest of the island there were no trees and very little cover. The three men worked carefully and methodically, beating up and down from the highest point to the water's edge, narrowly scanning the least irregularity in the rock which might point to the entrance to a cave. But there were no caves. They came at last, skirting the water's edge, to where General MacArthur sat looking out to sea. It was very peaceful here, with the lap of the waves breaking over the rocks. The old man sat very upright, his eyes fixed on the horizon. He paid no attention to the approach of the searchers. His oblivion of them made one at least faintly uncomfortable. Bloor thought to himself, "'It isn't natural. Looks as though he'd gone into a trance or something.' He cleared his throat and said in a would-be conversational tone, "'A nice peaceful spot you found for yourself, sir?' The general frowned. He cast a quick look over his shoulder. He said, "'There's so little time.' So little time. I, I really must insist that no one disturbs me, Bloor said genially. But we won't disturb you. We're just making a tour of the island, so to speak. Just wondered, you know, if uh, someone might be hiding on it. The general frowned and said, You don't understand. You don't understand at all. Please go away. Bloor retreated. He said as he joined the other two, He's crazy. It's no good talking to him. Lombard asked with some curiosity. What did he say? Bloor shrugged his shoulders. Something about there being no time and that he didn't want to be disturbed. Dr. Armstrong frowned. He murmured, I wonder now. The search of the island was practically completed. The three men stood on the highest point looking over towards the mainland. There were no boats out. The wind was freshening. Lombard said, No fishing boats out. There's a storm coming. Damn nuisance, you can't see the village from here. We could signal or do something. Bloor said, We might light a bonfire tonight. Lombard said, frowning, The devil of it is, that's all probably been provided for. In what way, sir? Well, how do I know? Practical joke, perhaps. We to be marooned here? No attention is to be paid to signals, etc. Possibly the village has been told there's a wager on. Some damn fool story, anyway. Law said dubiously. Think they'd swallow that? Lombard said dryly. It's easier of belief than the truth. If the village were told that the island was to be isolated until Mr. Unknown Owen had quietly murdered all his guests, do you think they'd believe that? Dr. Armstrong said, there are moments when I can't believe it myself. And yet... Philip Lombard, his lips curling back from his teeth, said, And yet... That's just it. You said it, Doctor. Bloor was gazing down into the water. He said, Nobody could have clambered down here, I suppose. Armstrong shook his head. I doubt it. It's pretty sheer. And where could he hide? Bloor said, or there might be a hole in the cliff. If we had a boat now, we could row round the island. Lombard said, If we had a boat, we'd all be halfway to the mainland by now. True enough, sir. Lombard said suddenly, We can make sure of this cliff. There's only one place where there could be a recess. Just a little to the right below here. If you fellows can get hold of a rope, you can let me down to make sure. Bloor said, might as well be sure, though it seems absurd on the face of it. I'll see if I can get hold of something. He started off briskly down to the house. Lombard stared up at the sky. The clouds were beginning to mass themselves together. The wind was increasing. He shot a sideways look at Armstrong. He said, You're very silent, Doctor. What are you thinking? Armstrong said slowly, I was wondering exactly how mad old MacArthur was. Vera had been restless all the morning. She had avoided Emily Brent with a kind of shuddering aversion. Miss Brent herself had taken a chair just round the corner of the house so as to be out of the wind. She sat there knitting. Every time Vera thought of her, she seemed to see a pale, drowned face with seaweed entangled in the hair, 
a face that had once been pretty, impudently pretty, perhaps, and which was now beyond the reach of pity or terror. And Emily Brent, placid and righteous, sat knitting. On the main terrace, Mr. Justice Wargrave sat huddled in a porter's chair. His head was poked down well into his neck. When Vera looked at him, she saw a man standing in the dock, a young man with fair hair and blue eyes and a bewildered, frightened face, Edward Seaton. And in imagination, she saw the judge's old hands put the black cap on his head and begin to pronounce sentence. After a while, Vera strolled slowly down to the sea. She walked along towards the extreme end of the island, where an old man sat staring out to the horizon. General MacArthur stirred at her approach. His head turned. There was a queer mixture of questioning and apprehension in his look. It startled her. He stared intently at her for a minute or two. She thought to herself, How queer! It's almost as though he knew. He said, Ah, it's you. You've come. Vera sat down beside him. She said, Do you like sitting here looking out to sea? He nodded his head gently. Yes, he said. It's pleasant. It's a good place, I think, to wait. To wait? said Vera sharply. What are you waiting for? He said gently, The end. But I think you know that, don't you? It's true, isn't it? We're all waiting for the end. She said unsteadily. What do you mean? General MacArthur said gravely. None of us are going to leave the island. That's the plan. You know it, of course, perfectly. What perhaps you can't understand is the relief. Vera said wonderingly, The relief? He said, Yes, of course. You're very young, you haven't got to that yet, but it does come, the blessed relief when you know that you've done with it all, that you haven't got to carry the burden any longer. You'll feel that too some day. Vera said hoarsely, I don't understand you. Her fingers worked spasmodically. She felt suddenly afraid of this quiet old soldier. He said musingly, You see, I loved Leslie. I loved her very much. Vera said questioningly, Was Leslie your wife? Yes, my wife. I loved her, and I was very proud of her. She was so pretty and so gay. He was silent for a minute or two. Then he said, Yes, I loved Leslie. That's why I did it. Vera said, You mean? And paused. General MacArthur nodded his head gently. It's not much good denying it now. Not when we're all going to die. I sent Richmond to his death. I suppose in a way it was murder. Curious. Murder. And I've always been such a law-abiding man. But it didn't seem like that at the time. I had no regrets. Serves him damn well right, that's what I thought. But afterwards... In a hard voice, Vera said, Well, afterwards? He shook his head vaguely. He looked puzzled and a little distressed. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It was all different, you see. I don't know if Leslie ever, ever guessed. I don't think so. But you see, I didn't know about her any more. She'd gone far away where I couldn't reach her. And then she died, and I was alone. Vera said, Alone. Alone and the echo of her voice came back to her from the rocks. General MacArthur said, You'll be glad, too, when the end comes. Vera got up. She said sharply, I don't know what you mean. He said, 
I know, my child, I know. You don't, you don't understand at all. General MacArthur looked out to sea again. He seemed unconscious of her presence behind him. He said very gently and softly, Leslie? When Bloor returned from the house with a rope coiled over his arm, he found Armstrong where he had left him, staring down into the depths. Bloor said breathlessly, Where's Mr. Lombard? Armstrong said carelessly, Gone to test some theory or other. He'll be back in a minute. Look here, Bloor, I'm worried. Oh, I should say we were all worried. The doctor waved an impatient hand. Of course, of course, I don't mean it that way. I'm thinking of old MacArthur. What about him, sir? Dr. Armstrong said grimly, What we're looking for is a madman. What price MacArthur? Law said incredulously, oh, You mean he's homicidal? Armstrong said doubtfully, well, I shouldn't have said so, not for a minute, but of course I'm not a specialist in mental diseases. I haven't really had any conversation with him. I haven't studied him from that point of view. Law said doubtfully, Gaga, yes, but I wouldn't have said... Armstrong cut in with a slight effort, as of a man who pulls himself together. You're probably right. Damn it all, there must be someone hiding on the island. Ah, here comes Lombard. They fastened the rope carefully. Lombard said, I'll help myself all I can. Keep a look out for a sudden strain on the rope. After a minute or two, while they stood together watching Lombard's progress, Bloor said, Climbs like a cat, doesn't he? There was something odd in his voice. Dr. Armstrong said, I should think he must have done some mountaineering in his time. Maybe. There was a silence, and the ex-inspector said, Funny sort of cove altogether. Do you know what I think? What? He's a wrong un. Armstrong said doubtfully, In what way? Bloor grunted. Then he said, Well, I don't know exactly, but I wouldn't trust him a yard. Dr. Armstrong said, I suppose he's led an adventurous life. Bloor said, oh, I bet some of his adventures have had to be kept pretty dark. He paused and then went on. Did you happen to bring a revolver along with you, Doctor? Armstrong stared. Me? Good Lord, no. Why should I? Bloor said, Why did Mr. Lombard? Armstrong said doubtfully, Well, suppose... habit. Bloor snorted. A sudden pull came on the rope. For some moments they had their hands full. Presently, when the strain relaxed, Bloor said, There are habits and habits. Mr. Lombard takes a revolver to out-of-the-way places right enough, and a primus, and a sleeping bag, and a supply of bug powder, no doubt. But habit wouldn't make him bring the whole outfit down here. It's only in books people carry revolvers around as a matter of course. Dr. Armstrong shook his head perplexedly. They leaned over and watched Lombard's progress. His search was thorough, and they could see at once that it was futile. Presently, he came up over the edge of the cliff. He wiped the perspiration from his forehead. Well, he said, we're up against it. It's the house or nowhere. The house was easily searched. They went through the few outbuildings first, and then turned their attention to the building itself. Mrs. Rogers' yard measure, discovered in the kitchen dresser, assisted them. But there were no hidden spaces left unaccounted for. Everything was plain and straightforward. A modern structure devoid of concealments. They went through the ground floor first. As they mounted to the bedroom floor, they saw through the landing window Rogers carrying out a tray of cocktails to the terrace. Philip Lombard said lightly, "'Wonderful animal, the good servant.' Carries on with an impassive countenance, Armstrong said appreciatively. Rogers is a first-class butler. I'll say that for him. Bloor said, His wife was a pretty good cook, too. That dinner last night. They turned into the first bedroom. Five minutes later, they faced each other on the landing. No one hiding, no possible hiding place. Bloor said, Oh, there's a little stair here. Dr. Armstrong said, it leads up to the servants' room, Bloor said. There must be a place under the roof for cisterns, water tank, etc. It's the best chance, and the only one. And it was then, as they stood there, 
that they heard the sound from above, a soft, furtive footfall overhead. They all heard it. Armstrong grasped Bloor's arm. Lombard held up an admonitory finger. Quiet. Listen. It came again, someone moving softly, furtively overhead. Armstrong whispered, He's actually in the bedroom itself, the room where Mrs. Rogers' body is. Bloor whispered back, Of course, best hiding place he could have chosen. Nobody liked it to go there. Now then, quiet as you can. They crept stealthily upstairs. On the little landing outside the door of the bedroom, they paused again. Yes, someone was in the room. There was a faint creak from within. Bloor whispered, Now! He flung open the door and rushed in, the other two close behind him. Then all three stopped dead. Rogers was in the room, his hands full of garments. Bloor recovered himself first. He said, uh, Sorry, uh, Rogers. Heard someone moving about in here and thought, uh, well... He stopped. Rogers said, oh, I'm sorry, gentlemen. I was just moving my things. I take it there will be no objection if I take one of the vacant guest chambers on the floor below? Uh, the smallest room? It was to Armstrong that he spoke, and Armstrong replied, Of course, of course, get on with it. He avoided looking at the sheeted figure lying on the bed. Rogers said, Thank you, sir. He went out of the room with his arm full of belongings and went down the stairs to the floor below. Armstrong moved over to the bed and, lifting the sheet, looked down on the peaceful face of the dead woman. There was no fear there now, just emptiness. Armstrong said, Wish I'd got my stuff here. I'd like to know what drug it was. Then he turned to the other two. Let's get finished. I feel it in my bones. We're not going to find anything. Bloor was wrestling with the bolts of a low manhole. He said, That chap moves damn quietly. A minute or two ago, we saw him in the garden. None of us heard him come upstairs. Lombard said, I suppose that's why we assumed it must be a stranger moving about up here. Bloor disappeared into a cavernous darkness. Lombard pulled a torch from his pocket and followed. Five minutes later, three men stood on an upper landing and looked at each other. They were dirty and festooned with cobwebs, and their faces were grim. There was no one on the island but their eight selves. Chapter 9 Lombard said slowly, So, we've been wrong, wrong all along. Built up a nightmare of superstition and fantasy, all because of the coincidence of two deaths. Armstrong said gravely, And yet, you know, the argument holds. Hang it all, I'm a doctor. I know something about suicides. Anthony Marston wasn't a suicidal type, Lombard said doubtfully. It couldn't, I suppose, have been an accident. Bloor snorted, unconvinced. Damn queer sort of accident, he grunted. There was a pause. Then Bloor said, About the woman, and stopped. Mrs. Rogers? Yes. It's possible, isn't it, that that might have been an accident? Philip Lombard said, An accident? In what way? Bloor looked slightly embarrassed. His red brick face grew a little deeper in hue. He said, almost blurting out the words, Look here, Doctor. You did give her some dope, you know. Armstrong stared at him. Dope? What do you mean? Well, last night. You said yourself you'd given her something to make her sleep. Oh, that, yes. A harmless sedative. What was it, exactly? I gave her a mild dose of trionol. Perfectly harmless preparation. Law grew redder still. He said, Look here, not to mince matters. You didn't give her an overdose, did you? Dr. Armstrong said angrily, I don't know what you mean. Law said, It's possible, isn't it, that you may have made a mistake. These things do happen once in a while. Armstrong said sharply, I did nothing of the sort. The suggestion is ridiculous. He stopped and added in a cold, biting tone, Or do you suggest that I gave her an overdose on purpose? Philip Lombard said quickly, Look here, you two. Got to keep our heads. Don't let's start slinging accusations about. Bloor said sullenly, I only suggested the doctor had made a mistake. 
Dr. Armstrong smiled with an effort. He said, showing his teeth in a somewhat mirthless smile, Doctors can't afford to make mistakes of that kind, my friend. Law said deliberately, It wouldn't be the first you've made, if that gramophone record is to be believed. Armstrong went white. Philip Lombard said quickly and angrily to Bloor, What's the sense of making yourself offensive? We're all in the same boat. We've got to pull together. What about your own pretty little spot of perjury? Bloor took a step forward, his hands clenched. He said in a thick voice, Perjury be damned! That's a foul lie! You may try and shut me up, Mr. Lombard, but there's things I want to know, and one of them is about you. Lombard's eyebrows rose. About me? Yes. I want to know why you brought a revolver down here on a pleasant social visit. Lombard said, You do, do you? Yes, I do, Mr. Lombard. Lombard said unexpectedly, You know, Bloor, you're not nearly such a fool as you look. That's as may be. What about that revolver? Lombard smiled. I brought it because I expected to run into a spot of trouble, Law said suspiciously. You didn't tell us that last night. Lombard shook his head. You were holding out on us, Law persisted. In a way, yes, said Lombard. Well, come on, out with it, Lombard said slowly. I allowed you all to think that I was asked here in the same way as most of the others. That's not quite true. As a matter of fact, I was approached by a solicitor. Morris, his name was. He offered me a hundred guineas to come down here and keep my eyes open. Said I'd got a reputation for being a good man in a tight place. Well? Law prompted impatiently. Lombard said with a grin, That's all. Dr. Armstrong said, But surely he told you more than that. Oh, no, he didn't. Just shut up like a clam. I could take it or leave it. Those were his words. I was hard up. I took it. Law looked unconvinced. He said, Why didn't you tell us all this last night? My dear man, Lombard shrugged eloquent shoulders. How was I to know that last night wasn't exactly the eventuality I was here to cope with? I lay low and told a noncommittal story. Dr. Armstrong said shrewdly, But now? You think differently. Lombard's face changed. It darkened and hardened. He said, Yes, I believe now that I'm in the same boat as the rest of you. That hundred guineas was just Mr. Owen's little bit of cheese to get me into the trap along with the rest of you. He said slowly, For we are in a trap. I'll take my oath on that. Mrs. Rogers' death, Tony Marston's, the disappearing Indian boys on the dinner table. Oh, yes. Mr. Owen's hand is plainly to be seen. But where the devil is Mr. Owen himself? Downstairs, the gong pealed a solemn call to lunch. Rogers was standing by the dining room door. As the three men descended the stairs, he moved a step or two forward. He said in a low, anxious voice, I hope lunch will be satisfactory. There is cold ham and cold tongue. I've boiled some potatoes, and there's cheese and biscuits and some tin fruits. Lombard said, Sounds all right. Stores are holding out, then? Oh, there is plenty of food, sir, of a tin variety. The larder is very well stocked. A necessity, that, I should say, sir, on an island where one may be cut off from the mainland for a considerable period. Lombard nodded. Rogers murmured as he followed the three men into the dining room. It worries me that Fred Narricot hasn't been over today. It's peculiarly unfortunate, as you might say. Yes, said Lombard. Peculiarly unfortunate describes it very well. Miss Brent came into the room. She had just dropped a ball of wool and was carefully rewinding the end of it. As she took her seat at table, she remarked, The weather is changing. The wind is quite strong, and there are white horses on the sea. Mr. Justice Wargrave came in. He walked with a slow, measured tread. He darted quick looks from under his bushy eyebrows at the other occupants of the dining room. He said, You have had an active morning. There was a faint, malicious pleasure in his voice. Vera Claythorne hurried in. She was a little out of breath. She said quickly, I hope you didn't wait for me. Am I late? Emily Brent said, You're not the last. The General isn't here yet. They sat round the table. 
Rogers addressed Miss Brent. Will you begin, madam, or will you wait? Vera said, General MacArthur is sitting right down by the sea. I don't expect he would hear the gong there, and anyway, she hesitated. He's a little vague today, I think, Rogers said quickly. I will go down and inform him luncheon is ready. Dr. Armstrong jumped up. I'll go, he said. You others start lunch. He left the room. Behind him he heard Rogers' voice. Will you take cold tongue or cold ham, madam? <laughs>